How's it going everyone? It's Chow here and today we are going to talk a little bit about species concepts as well as what exactly a species is and how to define it. So let's get started. Okay, so the first way of defining species concept, there are kind of three main ways to describe it. The first one is the biological species concept and this is the one that most people use, especially in classrooms in high school or middle school. So this is what oftentimes people grow up learning is a species. And the biological species concept is just simply stating groups of actually or potentially interbreeding populations that are cooperative or that are reproductively isolated from other groups. So there's a focus in this case on gene flow as well as reproductive isolation. The benefit of this particular concept is that it's looking at evolutionary independence. So groups can no longer exchange genes between different populations. That's a key factor in divergence. So if you, if you have a gene in one population that can't get into the system of another population over here, then that means that those two populations can ultimately diverge and become reproductively isolated, which is what really the biological species concept is. So you have focus on gene flow as well as reproductive isolation. So there's a key factor of sexually reproductive organisms going through these processes that ultimately prevent gene flow from one population to another, which results in species of uh, one species and then another species in another place. So that's really nice and all, and this is often what's presented in many populations. So you have, uh, for instance, uh, you have horses and donkeys, they produce mules, but mules are sterile, so they can't reproduce. For other species, there's some kind of uh, reproductive isolation by signaling. So these biological species concept prevent gene flow and also push for reproductive isolation. And that's all nice and, and good for this particular concept. The downfall, however, of biological species concepts is that it doesn't really work with species that reproduce asexually. So bacteria, for instance, reprodu reproduce asexually. But when it comes to the biological species concept, there's a strong focus on gene flow and sexual reproduction, which obviously can't, you know, can't really happen if you're an asexual uh, organism. And finally, if we're looking at fossil organisms, that can be very difficult to assess since you can't really breed fossils, otherwise that will get uh, pretty crazy. So the biological species concept is one of the three main ways of defining a species. The second way is a morphospecies concept, and this one I think makes the most general sense. It's looking at morphology, uh, plumage patterns, the shape, the size. And the benefit of this is it's widely applicable. So you can say that, oh, this organism is blue in color, this one is red in color, they're different species, which is often one of the most straightforward ways to do it. And oftentimes you can use this method to kind of get kids to understand the species concept is just by different organisms, different animals, for instance, looking different from one another. The, diff the, the sort of difficult issue with this particular concept, the morphospecies concept, is that it's highly subjective. So you have instances where sometimes one species might be considered one species and another might be considered a different species just simply by plumage patterns, but in reality they might actually be the same species and can uh, interbreed and reproduce and, and make a viable offspring. So the question, of course, is, is what's an instance where the morphospecies concept could be very useful then, since it seems very subjective? You know, you have a blue-colored bird and a red-colored bird. What happens if they're just regional variations? What happens if it's just sexual dimorphism? The male is red, the female is blue, something like that. So are there instances where morphospecies concepts could be very useful? And the answer is yes. For example, one of the great ones is actually fossils. So you can't breed fossils and you can't take genetics from fossils. Obviously the best thing you can do is to look at how they're different from one another. Now obviously even that can get a little bit complicated, but oftentimes it's the best we can do when it comes to separating fossil species. So the morphospecies concept is the second one. The third main way of defining species concepts is with the phylogenetic species concept. This one is often perhaps the most tricky one to understand, but it is one that's actually extremely accurate. So we often talk about phylogenetic trees or lineage analyses, and this is what we're talking about, looking at something like this. So the benefit of doing a phylogenetic analysis is that it's looking at 
things such as genetics, certain genes, certain mitochondrial genes maybe, and the mitochondrial DNA. And it's also looking at perhaps even whole genomes, if that's possible. So this is probably one of the most accurate ways to look at what exactly a species is and what how to separate one species from another species. But there are some downfalls about it. The first downfall is that there really aren't too many well-established phylogenies out there available. So that in itself can be a drawback to figuring out what is what. And then the second part of that is that genome sequencing, especially if you're sequencing the genome of an entire organism, that can get really complicated and it can get a little bit more expensive. Now over time that has gotten a lot cheaper, so this is, a, this is actually something you can do in a laboratory. It's especially, what, uh, it's especially good with things like bacteria and other species that are single-celled, but you can also do it with multicellular organisms like mammals and birds, and the human genome has already been sequenced as well. Now, what other issue that can arise as a result of using phylogenetic species concepts is that you can't analyze the genes of long extinct organisms. So we talked a little bit about the morpho species concept and how this is good for fossils. Well, you can't really look at the genes of a piece of rock, which is what a fossil is, so that means that really it can get a lot more complicated to try to figure out what particular organism belongs to what using phylogenetic species concept. So it's funny because there are some organisms that are extinct kind of recently. So if you're talking about like, um, I think the, the Tasmanian tiger as they call it, or the thylacine is what, what it's actually known as. You can potentially look at something like that, or maybe even woolly mammoths. You can look at their genomes if you can get some kind of intact tissue. And that means that there can be a little bit of genome sequencing that can be done. But overall, if we're talking about organisms that have been extinct for a really long time, then the phylogenetic species concept most likely falls below the morpho species concept. If so what's really fascinating is that you have all these species concept, but sometimes things get a little bit more complicated. So one of the times where things get a little bit more complicated is really with salamanders. We don't really have to look at warblers here, but just salamanders. And so salamanders, there is a situation where you have what's known as a ring species. And a ring species is a connected series of neighboring populations that can interbreed with relatively closely related populations, but for which there exists two N populations in the series that are too distantly related to interbreed. So you can look at these salamanders over here in California, and you can see that this population that's yellow can interbreed with this population here that's orange. This orange population can interbreed with this green population, and so on and so forth across the ring. But once you get from one side of the ring to the other, for instance, uh, this bluish population over here, this bluish population can no longer breed with this yellowish, po yellowish population, despite the fact that every step along the way, interbreeding can happen. So this kind of throws a wrench in things. But for the scope of the course, usually just keeping an eye on the biological species concept, the morpho species concept, as well as the phylogenetic species concept is often sufficient to get you a good understanding of how to define what a species is. So I hope you found this useful and uh, best of luck studying.